Hi, I'm Doug. I wrote the book The Guardsman under the pen name of R.G. Tark. We are on book number three. That's this one here. This is episode number 45. We are on chapters 110 through 113 in this episode. We are reaching the end. Please sit back, relax, and enjoy. When you get a chance, please hit that like, subscribe, and give it a uh, positive comment. That would be greatly appreciated. Nice to hear from you. Again, please sit back and enjoy. The Guardsman. Book 3, Wrath and Retribution. Episode 45. Chapters 110 through 113. Chapter 110. They swam across the freezing bay that night. They climbed all the way up the craggy cliff face in the dark rain slick night, with none of them falling to splat on the rocks below. They popped the bolts on all but one of the great's top legs, and then swung the whole thing to the side, allowing them all to climb into the half-meter wide culvert. Once inside, they had to push their lightened assault packs ahead of themselves upstream in the foul-smelling and lubricant-stained water that splashed up over and around their packs to splash in their faces before running chilling cold fingers down their fronts and legs. Every splash and splat ran down faces behind night vision, so it burnt and stung eyes and made skin feel sticky and slick. Jonas heard someone behind him right the grate and block it in place with a rock so it would sit at the correct angle as viewed from the outside, while the slick sticky drain water splashed all over his face and shoulders, drenching his front and legs, freezing his balls. They crawled around the drains in the impossible dark of night inside a subterranean drain. Their only comfort was their night vision while they spent the time familiarizing themselves with the culvert layout and scattered drainage grates above their heads. They found a good drain cover in a quiet corner of the courtyard and waited for the attack order. And waited some more. And then the sun came up. Irritatingly, Jonah's squad was ordered to hold the position at their next check-in. The rain didn't relent and continued to pour noisily down the wet stone and manufactured pipes before running down to the sea. They found a semi-dry spot between two grates, and while hunched over in the cave-like drain, they all changed uniforms to dry ones, saved by the double-tied trash bags that insulated their weapons and personal gear from the water as they swam. As the sun was setting, the sky was falling from miserable rainy gray into dark miserable rainy gray with a thunder and lightning storm rolling over them. They sat in a row just above the rushing drain water and stayed relatively dry. They spent their time quietly discussing what they should be doing, which was blowing up communications arrays and sabotaging ground-based planetary defenses. Their gear was prepped for the infiltration, more importantly, their orders had them set for the infiltration, so that was what they were going to do. They were going to do it regardless of the rain and the crappy stone drainage system where they were hidden. They heard a muffled blast that sounded like thunder. While some of the more senior soldiers were debating if it was thunder or a demo charge placed by another team, they received a single beacon flash on their communicator telling them to start their infiltration. Jonas watched his squad leader check, and he confirmed that local communications were out in the storm. His squad leader quietly and calmly ordered, Alpha team breach into the courtyard, move forward by bounds. Let's get these bastards. Jonas pulled his assault rifle free of its protective plastic bag and stepped silently forward to the edge of the water falling through the grate so he and his battle buddy could lift and clear the grate for their team's breach. Chapter 111 They were actually able to sneak out of their drainage grate and into the courtyard under cover of the wild thunder and lightning storm that had blown in from the sea. Jonas figured they'd be cut down by mass fire from the walls before he could draw a breath, so since they were alive, he figured they were doing pretty good for themselves. They slipped out of the damp cavern and replaced the grate. Each stepped forward quickly to the rain-swept shadows behind a utility outbuilding. They could all see League soldiers up on the walls, towers, and front gate. 
all looking out and walking their patrols with their night vision and modern weapons against the shadows and rain. It was extremely strange to see armored modern heavy infantry pacing about on stone battlements and into guard towers. In the dark and rain, Jonas heard the most insane order in the history of the universe. Their squad leader ordered them to port their arms and march to what appeared to be a food service loading dock across 50 meters of wide open rain swept courtyard under black skies racked by lightning. His heart was pounding a million kilometers a minute with every step. So they marched, scared stiff, right out from under the league guards' noses and into the main keep's civilian areas. They easily skirted and ducked the civilians as they minded their own business, darting around their normal household duties. They were all in their normal areas, not aware of what was going on, because they had not been told or seen anything change yet. Tarfona had never had to deal with a real security threat before. They had always been a capital world for hundreds of years. Their world had not seen war or dynastic strife since long before the foundation of the Kroinos hegemony. Their troops knew what they were doing. It just was not a required awareness their civilians on this world drilled. They didn't have the imminent threats of everything from invasion to piracy like the outer corporate empire worlds faced. People on this secure world didn't drill the militia tactics and combat awareness skills that were needed on the dangerous outer worlds. Once they were inside, Jonas started to enjoy himself. It was like a giant high-stakes game of hide-and-seek. They snuck and hid through various back corridors, storage rooms, and stairwells for more hours than Jonas thought were in a day. He had no sense of time because his heart was still pounding, and he was so scared he was hyper-aware of everything. Eventually, they had to stop working around the edges and servant corridors to press deeper into the as-yet-unalerted rooms where their objective lay. At about 03.30 local time, Jonas had his first silence fight in the palace proper. They moved like ghosts in the corridors and back halls. They deliberately fought very sparingly with knives or silenced weapons when absolutely necessary. When they did, they had to fall back between the teams while hiding the evidence of the few silent sentries. Even though they would temporarily fall back by teams to dispose of some evidence of their passing, they were still moving closer and closer to their objective. Eventually, someone would get wise to fewer sentries in the corridors. Fortunately for Jonas and his team, as deep as they were in the night, everyone's reaction times were slowing down. Jonas' team sergeant voiced his fear, If they do a comms check with any of these guys, we're done like Christmas dinner, sergeant. His squad leader snapped, Shut your noise hole. Would you rather we leave them laying around for their buddies to find so they can come in contact with us and our location? Jonas listened while he watched a switch back on the stairs through the sights of his silenced rifle. His team sergeant said, I'm just saying, sergeant, we need to haul ass or we're going to get pinched. Jonas heard the boot falls of a league sentry and was so close to him that when the soldier received his communications check Jonas could hear both the call and reply reporting everything was clear. The yawning sentry sergeant walked right around the corner just after he calm checked. The soldier turned and looked straight into Jonas' eyes. The second Jonas convulsively pulled the trigger dropping the man in his tracks. The only sounds were the wet slapping of the round striking flesh the light tinkling of the three spent shell casings, and the boneless collapse of the body. His team sergeant and Corporal Rush passed him clearing and holding the corner for seconds. Jonas felt frozen in place, unable to breathe, staring wide-eyed at the other soldier's boots. He just killed a man and did not even have time to realize it yet. His teammates both grabbed one boot and an arm lifted and hauled away the damage. They quietly congratulated him as they passed, but his guts were turning and he wanted to cry. The specialist in their squad stepped past with a solvent rag, 
they picked up in a janitor's closet to swipe over the floor, removing any blood stains he could see to disguise their passing. He stayed focused on his mark as the man he just killed was hustled off to a janitorial storage closet in their hall. Jonas heard his squad leader, who was behind him, tell one of their team sergeants that was the last of the sentries on that floor. They bound around a final corner and up the stairs of the CO's suite tower. Apparently, having cleared the last sentry for that level was a good thing, but was a goal no one had shared with him. He was moving in a haze like he was watching through someone else's eyes. Jonas felt completely detached and disbelieved he was actually seeing and doing these things. The stairs were the normal pitch, but cut up sharply from a landing to complete their run. There was some sort of thick but oddly shaped cornerstone in the corner of the landing, like it was buttressing something heavy above their heads at that corner. Just before stepping onto the landing's left turn up the last remaining stairs, they checked the corner with a dental mirror. Jonah's team sergeant was the one looking in the tiny mirror. He reported all with silent hand signals, and it was not good. There were four heavily armored troopers on the floor, two on guard at the door, and two more behind a desk in an antechamber off to the left side of the hall. Jonas and his recon squad were in cloth uniforms with chemical assault rifles. They had no way to penetrate that armor with their rifles. They are hopelessly outclassed against them. If it turned into a stand-up gunfight, it would end quickly and badly for their side. They were stuck and the clock was ticking until the fleet's arrival set off the general alarm which would have every League soldier on the planet at high alert and scrambling to battle positions. Chapter 112 Samson realized early on in the ship's final maneuvers that he really did not like sitting down when going into a fight. The whole Navy concept of stations graded on all his years of training and experience. He felt decidedly claustrophobic when seated like that, he wanted a rifle in hand and the ability to move and run, so he avoided the overly comfortable station that was offered to him by standing. It made Captain Brockish crazy because it was an easy way to be tossed about the bridge. When pressed on it, he conceded that anything large enough to rock their ship to that degree would probably smash a portion of the ship anyway, and they'd have bigger problems than Samson getting tossed a little. He finally dropped the pestering, much to Samson's relief. Samson watched in wonder as the finely tuned fleet jump erupted into the system and blossomed in and around Warsong's formation. The plan phased the arrival of the heaviest slow ships, first allowing them to reach their maximum acceleration around the sun. They were followed by progressively smaller groups of faster and faster ships that were timed to reach formation perfectly on the far side of the star. Fascinated, Samson watched as what had to be thousands of ships in a long thin line displayed on their bridge's position plot. They accelerated at fantastic speed, pulled by and sling shotting around the star by both gravity and their own momentum. It was not absolute chaos as he expected, but what looked like a precise marching display by soldiers on a pass in review. Each ship and squadron pulled smoothly into their position, closing the gaps with an orderly progression. They pulled closer and closer into a denser and denser formation as they moved to their communal jump point at the edge of the star's gravity well. The maneuver from behind the star would keep their arrival masked from the vast majority of Tarfona's long-range orbital sensors and all its planet-side direct observation devices. The finalized plan was clear that by the time they all left the sun's gravity well and their formation was set for their final in-system jump, that at the speeds they were traveling, it would take them less time to leave the backside of the star and its gravity well than it would take the light of their arrival to reach Tarfona. Samson had to adjust his thinking a little bit to deal with that reality. It didn't quite make his head hurt. He understood the physics and navigation principles well enough, 
but it was the mind-boggling realization that they would beat their light to their target that was awkward. Their fleet will appear over their target world before the light of their arrival alerted the enemy to their presence in the system. As a guy with a field career's worth of experience defeating sensors or grimly accepting that the enemy would see his unit coming, this was a realization that was hard to swallow. Like everything else in this damnable exercise, it flew into the face of all his years of experience. The main view screen at the front of the bridge flicked off the fleet positioning plot and into a long-range view of Tarfona. Captain Brockish leaned back in his station and relaxed his hands. They waited no more than fifteen seconds and three colossal explosions to the top, bottom, and left of the planet blossomed bright against the star field and burned themselves out. The fourth targeted station on the right flared smaller but continued to burn after the other three had gone out. The geosynchronous station on what to their view was now the near sun side of the planet was left unmolested. Captain Brockish reminded Samson, That was nine minutes and ten seconds ago. The reflected light before and subsequent blast from your little brainchild has just now reached us. Before Samson could think too much about that, the Admiral ordered the fleet to jump. Captain Brokish immediately ordered the same. Their pre-plotted maneuver at the edge of the star's jump debilitating gravity well was set so they would micro-jump from the sun to over Tarfona's north pole. That would place the fleet above the station currently on the sun side and underneath its engagement envelope. The fleet would be moving at speed, and before its weapons could track and the projectiles reach them, their fleet would skim over the thin polar atmosphere and curve of the planet. They would then make the plan dive around the back, now night side of the world, down to the planet's equator and the custom station that was deliberately avoided by their bombardment. Though widely spaced, both the custom station and defensive platform were positioned over Tarfona's largest city. Chapter 113 their fleet dropped into space over Tarfona's North Pole. Instantly, the fleet's position systems populated faster than the human eye could track new icons, showing every ship in perfect formation. It was only a two-minute jump, but before they were sufficiently clear of the gravity well for that jump, they spent several minutes passing through the corona and into visible space to the side of the star. Regardless of the time exposed to the planet, they still arrived only a few seconds after their light from sling shotting around the sun arrived at Tarfona's defensive observation centers. The station that had the best view of their maneuver was the station on the left side of the planet. One of the three that Samson had watched die eleven and a half minutes ago, as the nine-minute-old light reached his eyes and then the two-minute and some seconds jump. His eyes and experience told him that only three minutes had elapsed, but his academic brain reminded him of the differences. Regardless of the headache, that discrepancy was starting. During the post-jump acceleration change, the bottom line was that the station most likely to have been assigned to report their arrival from behind that portion of the star was now falling debris and a spreading gas cloud. On the planet below him, they probably and rightly now thought they had bigger things to worry about than adjusting sensor coverage. Before Samson fully felt his stomach settle after the jump deceleration, he was listening to their fleet admiral barking voice orders on arrival. Mission adjust. Kill that last platform. Southern, northern, western, and customs defensive platforms are down. Eastern platform is damaged and spinning but functional. Fleet will engage the platform in a focused fire barrage on the platform's damaged quad working across the superstructure. Detachment orders, even numbered cruisers, will detach under command of Warsong. Detachment orders. Detachment will drop atmospheric and destroy ground-based defensive installations and provide fire support to recon detachments. All ships inflict maximum amount of damage on military targets. Friendly troop ships inbound, planetary entry vector 79 by 212 EDA. 
seven and a half minutes. Disrupt and destroy the enemy wherever possible to clear a landing corridor in the battle space. All units fire. Fire, fire, at will as targets bear. Fleet calm out. Captain Brockish immediately issued orders to his bridge sections and had them call up the cruisers in a task force communications linkage. Samson kept his mouth shut while the work was distributed. When the captain was done with his initial flurry of orders, Samson asked Captain Brockish, I grasp the orders. I think I'm tracking which stations are destroyed. I've got the part about the bypass station on the sun side right now. Then there is the remaining damaged one on the side where the sun is due to come up. What's that number chain about the troop transports? Captain Brockish grouped the cruisers into sections by dragging his finger across them in groups of four creating maneuver groups, and then he flicked predesignated commonly used orders from his menu onto them. As those orders arrived, they maneuvered into more precise positions around the turning war song. Captain Brockish answered automatically while he worked shorthand entry vectors used by Naval Corporation. The first number is from the system's polar north. Planets and stars have magnetic attitudes, the north being zero degrees. In about six minutes and fifteen seconds from now, the transports will slam into the gravity well just above the equator and in line with the custom station and spaceport below. Given the time of day and entry vector, they will be trailing from the back third of the planet's orbital path. That's the 212 number. 180 being the night side of the planet farthest from the sun, zero being the side directly facing the sun. He flicked his fingers over his panel issuing orders and continued, local time is just before 04 in the morning. Samson nodded understanding, and the recon units running around the surface are doing their thing, breaking communications networks. So, in the combined hour, it will take the transports to arrive from jump, deploy dropships, and begin to strike targets. It will still be before most people are awake and off the street. So now we ground pounders are getting ready to do our thing. We make the plan for the time on the target between Rees and me. We send our target list to you Navy guys. We tell only a very limited number of your fleet brothers about our plan for the platforms. The captain interrupted Samson with a smile and shake of the head. Samson stopped speaking. Captain Brockish pulled a section of two ships forward and typed in a simple but important command to them as Samson watched over his shoulder. Ensure communications retrans with Fleetcom is not broken. Provide outer security and overwatch. The captain then spoke to Samson while he went back to issuing his permade orders. Don't forget I started as a ground pounder too. Stop excluding us, High Commander. Samson rolled his eyes with a sarcastic smile. Whatever, Captain. So anyway, we figured out how to squish the platforms and gave the Navy the invasion timeline. Then the Navy just backward planned the arrival times into navigation data, and instead of plotting a course to they plotted for the planned arrival time and backed out their jump entry times to hit that planned window. They took the known point and time in the future and then did all that horrific interstellar navigation and radial calculus pain that we all had to pass at the academy. Is that accurate? Nodding once, got it in one high commander. It's a little bit more complicated than the academically sterile star system to star system dross. They teach us at the academy with all the fleet ships and multiple jumps and complexity of the in-system maneuver with fluctuating arrangements of gravitational pulls as planets and large bodies move constantly. But yes. He paused for a second before continuing quietly. Sometimes I forget that you haven't been through the military corporation's joint senior services college. That's where they teach all that joint ground, naval, and support services corp integration stuff. Samson grumbled. It was on my to-do list after my second tour with the family. But other things came up, 
and that all didn't quite go as well as I'd planned. Communications, helm, and weapon stations were busy routing and coordinating everything from entry vectors to fire controls to locating priority targets based on known enemy military communications protocols. Samson watched slightly confused by the speed and complexity, but grasping the general maneuver as Captain Brockish slipped his fingers along his canted touch screen issuing orders and approving objectives for cruiser sections. Quietly the captain spoke while Samson watched his fingers flick back and forth. Don't worry about all that for now, sir. There's not a guardsman on this ship who would speak cross to or about you over something like that. Outside the fact I'd keel haul their ass by tying him to the bow and stretching him all the way back to our engines under acceleration without a suit if they did. There are only a handful of full colonels in our guardsmen ranks. One at the academy over the students and he's been talking about retirement for seven years. You've met and talked with him, I've heard. Myself, who doesn't want your job. One of us over the Guardsmen Academy Garrison's upper floors, garrison, medical, and training facilities. But from what I've heard, you know he's an ass. And while he wants your job, none of the rest of us wants to see him there. And finally, the two Guardsmen colonels we have on field duty over quick reaction regiments. Both of those two gentlemen will chafe under your limited time in service. If you treat them with the respect that they are due as veteran large unit commanders, they will salute and about face as ordered. Unlike that ass over the academy garrison and advanced training, they realize that pissing off or pissing on you will piss off your wife. And even if she doesn't express her frustrations to your father-in-law, who let us both not forget is also one of us, she will herself one day sit in the hegemony CEO's chair. Both know that pissing on her husband will not be a career advancing option. Seeing as how she is currently a huge minority shareholder of all three military corps as an individual and a majority owner of the holding corp that controls them, there is a lot of power there. Should her parents ever retire, those voting shares of hers will only become more concentrated. The long-term net result of that is there will be fewer people between herself and the headsman's acts for commanders who have displeased her professionally or personally. Our regimental commanders are smart enough to see that. You'll have their support. Samson admitted, Thank you, Captain. I have been out of the loop for too long. For the last many months, I have been playing catch up with one fire leading to the next. I haven't even taken the time to properly greet our senior field officers. I don't, however, like people thinking that I'm hiding behind my wife. That seems a, a little emasculating. Looking up from his panel with hard eyes, high commander, any officer without the brains and tact to understand that you are not only standing on merit alone, but that your family relations only serve to concentrate power in the military corporations more firmly around our guardsmen, doesn't have the common sense required to hold a military VP or regimental command position. Long term, the presence of not only one, but now two, guardsmen in the hegemony's leading house which I will continue to remind you also holds massive voting positions in the three military corporations, will ensure our place as the premier military force in the hegemony for generations to come. Quietly, Samson returned, Ah, uh, I see your point. Let me see if I can pull forward the rest of your thread on this subject. In a few years, if our coupe de grace here works, and assuming we two survive without being splattered into atoms, we end the regional war with the League. We channel our replacements into expanding our guardsmen ranks, instead of replacing the casualties we've been taking during our incessant warfare with the League. We backfill the excessive demand for security details, and then use the funds to expand our two reaction brigades. Before we know it, we subdivide our two brigades and have a guardsman division with four infantry brigades. Each brigade with a full colonel in command 
and a chief of staff who would be a full colonel, plus two assistant division commanders as new guardsmen equivalent rank of brigadier generals, plus we create a new guardsman equivalent rank to major general commanding the division. Samson paused for a second and smiled while Captain Brockish went leisurely back to work before speaking quietly again. I suppose you would want to have a battleship to play with too? Equally quietly, the captain replied while his fingers played over the blossoming red on his screen. Battleships have a nice big admiral's cabin with a nice big desk all their own, high commander. Slipping into his powerful command voice, the captain snapped, Comms, relay to ground units, general push, fire support on station and available. Pre-plotted fire missions are on the way. Standard priority target sequence in place. Ground to space batteries, military and civil communications satellites and ground relay stations. Endo-exo atmospheric fighters, fighter installations and ground support facilities, enemy armor formations, enemy troop concentrations. He did not even wait for an acknowledgement. He just shifted his direction to another officer. Fire control, fire missions approved. Weapons free on approved target classes. Stations report when complete. With the twitch of his middle finger dropping gently on his own touch screen, the fire control officer reported, Fire control executing. Communications reported a second later. Message sent, acknowledgments from ground units inbound. Captain Brockish reminded, comms understood, send a low priority reminder that they're on the clock. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your listening. When you get a chance, please come and hit the like, subscribe, leave a comment, and check out the book for real down in the description.